Okay, thank you to all the audience who follows our broadcast. We are live on the second day of the 2020 International Web-Based Neurosurgery Congress. Remember, we're streaming on YouTube Live too, and you can follow CN accounts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Well, today we have the honor of having Dr. Michael Levy. Dr. Michael Levy is a well-known pediatric neurosurgeon. He's the chief of pediatric neurosurgery at Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego, where he works in oncological and pediatric vascular neurosurgery. He's also a professor in UC San Diego School of Medicine. Today at the IWBNC, Dr. Levy is going to share his lecture, The Management of Complex Pediatric Aneurysmal Malformations. You can type the questions in the Q&A section and we will read the questions to Dr. Levy after he finishes his intervention. Welcome Dr. Levy again. Thank you for being part of this and the microphone is all yours. Oh, thank you. I very much appreciate it. Um, today I'm going to talk about my experience with vascular malformations uh, in children, just talking about the disparities uh, between kind of adult populations and pediatrics. Uh, I'm not certain, but a lot of what we see, uh, at least in California, uh, varies somewhat significantly from um, kind of the literature regarding pediatric aneurysm. So I'm going to try to give a sense of uh, our experience um, um, and then uh, show some 3D imaging that we're using currently that uh, facilitates the treatment of these kids. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, I also want to thank uh, my professors, Taka Fukushima and Stephen Giannata, who uh, both were uh, critical in my uh, becoming uh, uh, better at doing these types of cases. So anatomically, we tend to see some strange things in kids, and that's probably the best description. Uh, the way I think of this is that uh, these lesions are present in utero. Uh, a lot of times they've already defined alternative pathways of flow. Um, and I'll get to that later, but um, you're dealing with complex anatomy and it, it really changes the way that you approach and think about these lesions. Uh, this was a youngster that presented with a bleed. Um, this was a CTA uh, looking at uh, the anatomy. Um, and then this is a three-dimensional reconstruction showing a carotid terminus aneurysm uh, that was treated with a single clip. Uh, but lesions such as this are, are somewhat frequent and um, sometimes determining whether something is fistulous in nature, uh, a true aneurysm or a variant of both uh, uh, is really impossible. Uh, this is another example. This is actually an aneurysm that's kind of poking out towards us, but you can see this was in 1993 uh, when we were initially trying to coil these aneurysms that they can be quite complex. And at that time, I don't think the interventional techniques were uh, useful for children. This is another case where we're looking at basically an origin of the right uh, SCA and PCA. Uh, and so this is an actatic abnormality that we watched uh, that sub subsequently became aneurysmal in nature. This is a five month old. And uh, we had a, a series of, of younger kids with uh, these big IC bifurcation aneurysms. Um, this, I believe, was the youngest child ever to be put on cardiac bypass um, for clip ligation. And this was a clip reconstruction uh, that we did um, requiring multiple clips. Uh, this was also early 90s. You can see we weren't using plating to close the skull, we were using uh, just metal wire, uh, but we had uh, great success with this, uh, and we had a very similar case in a four-month-old, uh, almost a duplicate aneurysm, another child we put on cardiac bypass, um, and this was uh, kind of a oblique view showing uh, a clip reconstruction. We do see some normal aneurysms. This was a 17-year-old a that presented with a uh, an ophthalmic aneurysm, pretty um, adult looking in nature. Uh, the issue with this is that um, this was so proximal to the dura that we actually had to modify the clip intraoperatively um, uh, just because we didn't have a clip that would adequately uh, allow 
to secure this aneurysm without kind of hubbing up against the dura, uh, and that was problematic. We see a lot of multiple aneurysms in kids, and this is PCA distribution um, aneurysm that was actually treated interventionally. Uh, and once again, young child, open fontanelle, um, and a lot of difficulties with regard to the amount of radiation you want to give, the amount of contrast you can give in a study, uh, which makes um, both open and interventional uh, treatments for these cases difficult. This is a 3D reconstruction of another uh, set of aneurysms, uh, some of which are fistulous in nature, um, but uh, nonetheless difficult, especially when they present with rupture, uh, which these frequently do in our experience. This is another youngster, open fontanelle presented with this uh, uh, abnormal anterior kind of uh, uh, multilobulated <clears throat> aneurysmal structure. And this was treated with clip ligation. This is another example um, of what looks aneurysmal in nature on imaging studies, uh, but really represents just anomalous anatomy. Um, this is a child that really has kind of a pigtail um, carotid heading up uh, into the MCA segment. Uh, and the problem with these pigtail cases is when you get axial studies, uh, you really see kind of an abnormal picture. Uh, even the reconstructions are abnormal. What's problematic is we found out that over the years, these kids develop aneurysms, usually distal uh, to the pigtailing. Uh, and so we have a number of these kids that we've been following for 10, 15 years, uh, and the majority of which are developing aneurysms that need to be treated. Uh, the difficulty in treating the aneurysms is it has to be an open procedure. Uh, with the pigtailing, there's no way uh, to do a pipeline uh, and interventional procedures become uh, pretty much uh, something we can't utilize. And this is another example of this pigtailing phenomena that we see and kind of the anomalous vasculature associated with it. In and of itself, these anomalies aren't uh, problematic or difficult to deal with because there's nothing to do. It's just the way the, the child was born. Uh, these are all things that are present in utero. The difficulty is the flow dynamic that obviously changes over the course of a lifetime. Um, this is another A1 aneurysm in a child that we found in a 16-year-old. I have a a worry when I do these cases, and it's usually anyway from the IC bifurcation uh, or carotid terminus along the MCA, uh, where we're seeing vessels that are just diseased. And I remember the first case I saw was back uh, when I was at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles uh, with Taka Fukushima, uh, and basically told me while we were looking at the aneurysm that once we tried to mobilize the, the vessel, it was essentially going to blow out. Uh, and in mobilizing the vessel with an Ichiban dissector, that's exactly what happened. Um, we've had a myriad of these cases, and, and despite uh, what appear to be simple appearances on the imaging studies, uh, these are the cases that are, are really most worrisome um, and uh, kind of take a lot of uh, thought before uh, intervening. Uh, this is one such case. Uh, and this was treated with a clip ligation. It's difficult to see, but this is actually a sunt clip. Uh, I prefer using sunt clips for these lesions because uh, if I get uh, a medial wall uh, that blows out uh, during the surgical intervention, uh, a sunt clip gives us the best chance of securing the aneurysm. The problem with the sunt clip is the uh, potential that you can take perforators. Here you can see there was an associated infarct uh, in treating this child. This is another example. Uh, this is a bilobed aneurysm. Uh, once again, uh, difficult aneurysms in that you're dealing um, with uh, a disease segment. Uh, we attempted to treat this uh, with a pipeline. Um, the pipeline was placed successfully and approximately three days after pipeline placement, the distal component uh, just after the pipeline blew out and the child died. This is another case, um, and uh, once again, aneurysm 
uh, that I was worried uh, is diseased. I will get to this later, but this is a young uh, uh, woman with Epstein-Barr virus uh, with cardiac uh, aneurysms uh, that prevented, presented our service following a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, given my experience with uh, the interventional uh, procedures. I, I was worried about treating it uh, with an interventional inter uh, procedure, but uh, we ended up doing so. Uh, this is another such case. This was a case, once again, put a sunt clip on. Um, though it didn't appear that the sunt clip was restrictive, uh, we had significant spasm uh, of the vessel once we placed the sunt clip. We removed the sunt clip, uh, still significant spasm of the MCA segment. Um, this was an uh, intraoperative uh, angiogram uh, following application of Rapamil. Uh, basically kept on treating the child. Uh, the vessel fattened up. We were able to replace the clip uh, and this child did well. Another carotid terminus aneurysm in a 12 year old. And this was treated with a clip ligation. I see bifurcation in an eight-year-old. And so the question with some of these aneurysms is based upon the fact it's a pediatric population, uh, when would one consider bypass as a treatment option in these kids? Um, by bypass, I mean basically drilling out glass cocks, getting the C5 component, doing an endocide uh, saphenous bypass to the C component, uh, basically kind of contralateral to the uh, origin of the ophthalmic, opening up Pernetsky's ring and putting a, a, a clip there. Um, we had a number of cases where we did such. Uh, I put uh, Taka's uh, paper from 1990 where he did 18 patients, uh, had an 89% uh, um, rate of, of basically graft patency. We've done a total of eight patients to date. Uh, four of them remain patent, 50%, uh, uh, which is well below uh, what was being seen in adults. Um, the difference is we had no compromise uh, when we had grant graft occlusion. Uh, and it's hard to really kind of understand why that might be the case. Let me go back to that. Um, it may be that these are just developmental anomalies and um, there's already a redistribution of flow um, that we just don't get enough uh, uh, imaging on in younger children. Uh, it could be from graft uh, host disparity. We're using saphenous grafts as opposed to uh, arterial grafts. The grafts are always mismatched with regard to the uh, anatomy in a young child, and that could be the issue. Um, it could also be the duration of the intervention, um, the amount of time it takes to do um, a graft, uh, even though it's the same in adults and, and pediatric cases, uh, may not be as uh, well with regard to being tolerated by kids, which lead to occlusion. Uh, in any event, we've had success uh, with these, but I've also noted once they occluded, it was an issue. So uh, rather than bypass, we've actually uh, gone to doing more cases uh, with a trap uh, kind of exclusion. This is cavernous sinus aneurysm in a youngster. This was a successful bypass. Uh, we do see uh, a large number of giant as aneurysms in kids. Uh, this is an example which I'll discuss later, uh, but a posterior fossa, kind of a vertebral variant uh, giant tumor. Uh, and this was in a two-year-old. We see a lot of acute presentations uh, in children. Uh, this was an aneurysm that blew out that was uh, uh, anomalous. Not only that, but it basically has significant dilatation, almost uh, looking like a vein of Galen uh, variant. Once this was treated, you can see the vein of Galen abnormality is, is back to normal. Uh, the problem with the hemorrhage is it created uh, uh, a significant uh, bleed, but also uh, uh, injury to the brain in this child. This is a six month old presented with a big hemorrhage and subdural hematoma. 
Here you can see partial filling of an aneurysm. Uh, a lot of times we find in these big aneurysms in little kids that uh, uh, a significant amount of the aneurysm is thrombosed. Here you can see partial filling. You can see the anterior cerebral is also bowed out. And, and this was just a, a, a very large aneurysm uh, that was displacing um, the vasculature. Uh, and this is us removing clots and treating the an aneurysm intraoperatively. This is an acon aneurysm ruptured, uh, kind of blew out laterally uh, with uh, inner um, ventricular blood uh, and intracerebral hemorrhage. And this was treated with a clip ligation with a single clip. Uh, this is another aneurysm, uh, basically off middle cerebral. And this was treated with clip ligation. This is a seven-year-old. Uh, this is a PCA aneurysm. And uh, we tend to see a large number of PCA aneurysms that also rupture uh, in a younger population. This is a seven-year-old with a posterior choroidal aneurysm, also ruptured. Uh, treatment with uh, clip ligation, a lot of artifact, uh, but single clip. Uh, this is another uh, large aneurysm, um, probably about three times uh, as big as it appeared on this imaging. You can kind of see uh, what appears to be a, a wall around it, but the aneurysm actually extended. And you can see um, this is something that's been present for many, many years. Uh, you can see the displacement of the bony anatomy given the size of the aneurysm uh, and the long-term nature with which uh, this aneurysm was present. Uh, this is an aneurysm that ruptured, uh, basically had uh, a devastating impact on the patient. You can see we had to do a decompressive craniectomy. Patient ended up requiring a shunt. Patient ended up having uh, a synthetic pla uh, flap placed. Uh, and this was treated with clip ligation. Uh, and this is the flap replacement on the child. And you can see the shunt. Uh, it, this basically is a, is a good way to remind ourselves that these are very small children um, and very large clips. Even the micro clips that we use uh, still seem to be uh, somewhat significant in some of the smaller children we're treating. Posterior aneurysms, uh, I mean, everybody understands the fact that a large number of aneurysms in children involve the posterior circulation. Um, uh, this is an SCA, um, I'm sorry, um, a PCA aneurysm. Another posterior circulation aneurysm. And that was treated with a single clip. Uh, this actually looks like it was a variant uh, coming off of a uh, anomalous branch off the anterior spinal artery. That was treated with clip ligation. Um, vertebral artery, um, basically fusiform dilatation with a little tit that uh, actually uh, probably was the rupture site. This was uh, a pike aneurysm that we saw in a five month old. Uh, and we ended up resecting it uh, and then treating the child uh, with a pica pica bypass. Uh, this is kind of a, a slide to remind us of, of just kind of how abnormal these things can be. This was uh, really kind of a combination of a fistula ion aneurysm. Uh, this was a six-year-old child uh, presented with headache. This was an angiogram. This is an intraoperative angiogram. And you can see this was done in 1997, and this was when I was at USC. Um, and this was a stereolithographic model that we made. Uh, things were much more difficult 
back then uh, in that it took us a month to really have this constructed. Uh, and we wanted to have it constructed before we did the surgery, basically, uh, to allow us to plan for the surgical intervention. Um, but we really have it much easier these days, both with the virtual model and the stereolithographic models that are uh, really pretty uh, easy to obtain. This is a 15-year-old vertebral segment aneurysm. Uh, this was one that was treated uh, with an interventional technique, was essentially coiled. Um, the aneurysm started to dilate around the coil uh, and ended up being trapped uh, using a clip trap technique. 12 month old uh, with basically a basilar tip aneurysm. Uh, clip ligation. This was 1993 um, and treated with a single clip. This was a 12 year old child that presented to San Diego with a bleed. Uh, unfortunate story is that we uh, put the child on cardiac bypass to try to do a reconstruction uh, to treat this aneurysm. Uh, the patient uh, started bleeding while being cooled down for the bypass intervention uh, and unfortunately died three days later. This was a five-year-old uh, presented uh, with a basilar aneurysm. Uh, and we treated this uh, with an interventional technique. This is another case, um, basically three-dimensional reconstruction of an aneurysm uh, with what appears to potentially be a small teeth there that, that could have uh, ruptured. But when dealing with complex aneurysms, especially in children, there's a lot of considerations uh, and it really modifies the way that we approach these. Um, and with this, we basically had a fetal right PCA. Uh, and so the question was, is this part of a right PCA that's getting washed out, which is what we thought to be the case, or is it actually the site of rupture? Uh, and this was a case that uh, uh, was coiled. This was the young girl I had talked about before, basically presented with a cardiac aneurysm, uh, history of Epstein-Barr virus, presented with a very subtle subarachnoid hemorrhage, required, required a ventricular catheter placement. This was the imaging. Um, my concern is once again, this was uh, um, worrisome for me that this could be a disease segment, uh, especially given the history of Epstein-Barr. Um, kind of weighed back and forth the decision whether to uh, do an open procedure um, or treat it with the interventional technique, uh, given the fact that she was 17 years old, uh, we opted for an interventional technique. This was performed by uh, Alex Klesi uh, at UCSD. Uh, and you see there was a coil placed uh, with a proximal pipeline uh, and a distal pipeline. So this was actually secured with coil and dual pipeline bypass. This is a 13 year old. Uh, this is another vertebral segment uh, aneurysm that failed treatment and required uh, uh, clip ligation um, and trapping. Um, this is another case of a child that had coiling of a basilar aneurysm where um, the concern is, is that the aneurysm continues to grow despite the fact that it's coiled. Uh, obviously something you can see in adults, but I think that we're seeing more of this in children. And this is <clears throat> one of the problems I have when we operate on these is, is really making the determination uh, as to whether uh, younger children uh, should be coiled or not. This was that case of uh, vertebral segment aneurysm that was coiled uh, and needed to be trapped because it kept on growing uh, around the coil. Uh, this is another case I did with Steve Giannata, uh, large vertebral artery aneurysm, uh, what appeared to be a successful coiling, uh, except you can see that there's a redemonstration of the aneurysm, continued redemonstration of the aneurysm. Uh, so the decision was basically to approach the aneurysm, clip it, uh, interoperably found in attempting to clip the aneurysm that the coils became an obstruction. 
this is an intraoperative photo showing that the coils were actually perforating through the wall of the aneurysm. And these are the coils that were removed from the aneurysm. We were able to remove the coils, secure the aneurysm, and the child uh, had a very good outcome. This is actually a carotid aneurysm, the result of a uh, ENT intervention that was coiled. Uh, the coils actually, once again, eroded through the aneurysm and the patient presented with aggressive bleeding. Uh, and on examination, uh, all of these coils basically uh, poking out behind where the tonsil uh, should be. Uh, these uh, coils were removed uh, and this patient had a good outcome. So basically in our, our series, we've had uh, 44 cases, which I consider to be complex with regard to abnormal anatomy, uh, giant uh, size in nature, uh, or just a, a combination of uh, abnormal anatomy uh, and difficult bleeds uh, in young children. Uh, and these are kind of the characteristics. Uh, most notably, we have trapped 10 of them uh, standard clip ligation in 15, uh, three required cardiac arrest, one of which died, eight were wrapped, and eight of these patients went bypass procedures, uh, once again, 50% of which occluded. The most difficult cases are really the infants and neonates, uh, and so I'm really kind of going to spend the last part of this talk discussing uh, our current approaches with uh, infant and neonatal lesions. We have a series currently of 24 uh, infants and neonates less than 36 months, 16 males, eight females with a mean age of 12.2 months. And these are the presentation characteristics. Uh, it's surprising only two presented with hydrocephalus given uh, that, that most difficult presentations in kids tend to uh, end up uh, resulting in hydrocephalus. Uh, two with ICH, uh, one with developmental delay, and one with the steel phenomena. Twenty-one were spontaneous in nature, two were believed to tra be traumatic, and one was infectious. So 58% were basically anterior circulation, five IAC bifurcation, three pericolosal, six MCA and 37% posterior circulation, one basilar, three pica, and four P2 aneurysms. And giant aneurysms represented 42% uh, of the series. Treatment, basically endovascular uh, in five patients, trapping in nine, trap excision versus trap excision bypass, specifically pica pica bypass. Uh, and then clip ligation in nine with five with clip ligation, two with clip ligation and arrest, and two that were uh, clipped and wrapped. One patient was non-operative, and this was essentially a child that presented uh, with uh, an aneurysm that filled about 90% uh, in the intracranial contents, and it was opted uh, not to intervene on this child, obviously, and that child was allowed to die. With regard to modeling, uh, five uh, patients that had trap excision, one with trap excision and bypass, and uh, one that had clip ligation. So with regard to outcomes, uh, with the patients that uh, underwent clip ligation, basically an 11% morbidity and 11% mortality. Uh, the mortality seemed significant, but it was one patient that actually rebled re and died. Uh, and that was a P2 uh, aneurysm. Uh, one patient had transient paresis uh, following an intraoperative rupture. Of those that were trapped uh, with a clip trap, there was no morbidity, no mortality. Uh, six remained intact. Two were intact, uh, both with a baseline paresis that they presented with that was unchanged. Uh, one uh, did well despite the fact that there was a post-op uh, ICH. With our endovascular, uh, basically, there was a 20% morbidity and a 40% mortality in those kids. And obviously, no treatment resulted in 100% mortality. Trapping tends to be most successful in our series, and this is probably very specific 
uh, to not only the fact that we're a referral center for these type of lesions, but also for the propensity of uh, posterior circulation um, developmental anomalies that we're seeing in kids. So these are seven cases we did of preoperative virtual modeling. And all these cases did well after surgical interventions. There's basically three considerations in infants and young children. Um, the purpose of preoperative planning is to really increase your anatomic recognition, um, really trying to facilitate uh, minimizing your entry, uh, getting to uh, the important anatomy quickly, um, avoiding blood loss, uh, all things that are important for younger children. Um, and uh, these type of techniques really facilitate these approaches. Um, our belief is that it uh, decreases the time that it actually takes to get to the aneurysm um, and intervene surgically in the actual surgical duration is diminished. And these are all important considerations in very young, young children. The primary issue in kids is blood volume. Uh, when you look at uh, estimated blood loss and sustainable loss, um, you really sometimes are dealing with 20, 30, 45 cc's uh, before you need to intervene with regard to transfusion. Based upon this, we start transfusion in all of these kids at the time of incision. Uh, Timing is very important in younger kids. Uh, the longer a child, uh, that's three, four, five months is on the table, uh, the more additive the prolonged oozing can be with regard to your estimated blood loss. Uh, you can get uh, more bleeding uh, as they start to lose temperature. Uh, the room actually needs to be kept very warm. The child needs to be kept warm. Um, and we've had kids that have actually become coagulopathic as a result of what was felt to be minimal blood loss um, and low temperatures. Uh, structural considerations that uh, really kind of lend themselves to a uh, understanding that a pediatric neurosurgeon has is you can lose a significant amount of blood through an extremely vascular scalp in approaching um, these lesions in kids. Uh, the pericranium can be extremely vascular as can be the bone. So we tend to leave the pericranium intact. Stripping the pericranium is going to lead to more blood loss and that's problematic. Uh, aggressively waxing uh, bone is very important because there can be a significant amount of blood loss uh, from bone. Opening the dura can be uh, problematic just because of the presence of dural lakes. Uh, a lot of anomalous dural lakes are present in children uh, and this can lead to significant bleeding uh, better to avoid these, but if they can't be avoided, uh, experience with treating them uh, is the next best thing. 45 cc's for a lot of these kids is kind of the magic number uh, and really represents a minimal amount of blood loss when you're talking about uh, a successful surgical intervention um, as opposed to coating uh, a child on the table while you're trying to secure an aneurysm. So this was a large vertebral segment aneurysm. This was a 3D model that we constructed really to, to facilitate uh, the intervention. Uh, it allowed us to see basically the entry point and exit point through a limited craniotomy. We were able to clip both, um, basically decompress this aneurysm and excise it. This is a thrombosed MCA aneurysm. Uh, and essentially what this allowed us to do um, is determine where the aneurysm was and anatomically how to approach it, despite the fact that it was thrombosed and we couldn't see it uh, on angiography or any of our imaging studies. This was another case. Uh, this was a child that was approximately seven uh, days old, uh, presented with a very large convexity uh, abnormality. Uh, modeling allowed uh, for us to determine the best way to get in and secure uh, the feeding vessel. Um, we were able to trap this, uh, remove the clot, um, and do an excision of the lesion um, with no compromise uh, to the child. This was a bilobed aneurysm. Uh, once again, uh, these segmental aneurysms are, are worrisome for um, 
a disease segment, uh, at least in my experience. Uh, and based upon these 3D reconstructions, this is a case we opted for uh, clip ligation and wrapping as opposed to an interventional procedure. This was a large, uh, basically, uh, MCA distribution aneurysm uh, in a young child. Uh, basically, wanted to determine if we could do a clip ligation and an excision, uh, basically get a sense of the perforators, uh, and trying to get a good sense of really how to do a, a small procedure for a big aneurysm in a small child. So basically preoperative planning using what's called a SNAP software and the, what the SNAP software does um, is it allows you to uh, take your CT angiograms or your MR angiograms. Um, you can superimpose um, the studies uh, and it allows you to take that information and incorporate it into a three-dimensional model. Uh, and this is a virtual model. That model then allows you to uh, kind of reconstruct uh, anatomically what you're going to find surgically. Uh, you can approach it through a standard approach uh, using the anatomic model, um, or uh, you can walk through the model. You can see it from any number of different angles, uh, and it really increases your anatomic recognition so you have a complete understanding uh, of the aneurysm before you start the procedure. Uh, once again, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that it decreases the time until you obtain proximal control, which is really kind of the single most important variant uh, in treating very young children uh, and also decreasing surgical duration. Uh, as to whether it decreases the surgical morbidity and mortality, uh, we've had seven patients that we've used such modeling on, uh, most of which with uh, giant or difficult aneurysms. Uh, it's much too limited. Uh, a series to really make any recommendations based upon such. Uh, it's a pediatric series, um, not an uh, adult series. Uh, and additionally, we're still at a place uh, with regard to endovascular interventions uh, that I am not convinced of the utility uh, of one versus the other as comparing it to surgical interventions. The important considerations is, is this is an adult disease. Uh, I think the pathophysiology differs. We're not dealing with hypertensive individuals. We're not dealing with high cholesterols. Um, and we're dealing with very different presentations in these kids. I think a lot of these develop in utero. Uh, because of that, um, I think we can do things uh, and be more aggressive than you can be in an adult. Um, we're doing uh, trap excisions. Uh, really in segments where you'd expect there to be perforators and you'd expect to be a perforator injury um, with that type of approach, and we're not seeing that. And I think that's a testament to the fact that given that these uh, are purely anatomical phenomena, uh, we can do things in children that are a little more aggressive than we potentially could do in adults with better results. Uh, I don't know what to say about bypass early on. Uh, we thought bypass was an appropriate means uh, with 50% occlusion rate in our eight cases and having no poor outcomes because of the occlusion, uh, I think trap um, excision is probably uh, just as good. Uh, and that's been our very limited experience um, to date in a, in a total of eight patients. Uh, there's really no, no good nomenclature for description. Uh, you can have uh, a various mixture of these type of lesions, whether it be uh, uh, true aneurysms, uh, whether they can be fistulous in nature with aggressive aneurysm uh, or arterialized blood flow. Um, and I, I think with a lot of these cases, uh, uh, the description of being fistulous doesn't do the lesion justice because a lot of these do present with bleeds. Um, the advantage is, is these can be trapped and excised, uh, but you're dealing with pressurized arterial blood uh, in usually very large lesions in very small children. Um, and I think that's the problem. Uh, I can't overemphasize the fact that neonates and infants die very quickly. Um, and what one would assume to be not aggressive blood loss can lead to the need for chest compressions, pressors, and, and really change the dynamics of the operative setting significantly. 
uh, potentially leading to very, very bad results. Uh, and so just attention to blood loss at every level of procedure is important. And that's why I think preoperative modeling and imaging is vitally important because the quicker you can get there and the quicker you can get out, uh, the better chance of success that you're gonna have uh, in these children. I'm gonna show a quick video that we took intraoperatively And this is that giant convexity aneurysm in the seven-year-old. Uh, and you see, we can basically discolor the walls so we can see through the aneurysm. We can see vessels on the contralateral side. Uh, we can then add color. We can see the draining vessel. We can see the feeding vessel. We can see vessels that presumptively uh, are attached to the dome of the aneurysm, but not necessarily part of the aneurysm, uh, things that obviously need to be avoid avoided. Uh, we can look at the bony anatomy and really determine what the best uh, approach is going to be, surgically speaking. Uh, and so these are all things we can do before surgery that really facilitate the intervention. Uh, this being a very large aneurysm and a very small child, uh, you either have a good result or a bad result. And uh, this type of imaging really gives us a significant advantage uh, in dealing with these children. Um, Solid modeling, uh, I'm a bigger fan of. Uh, the solid modeling uh, really represents a significant benefit um, and being able to have these stereolithographic models uh, where you not only have the vascular anatomy but also the skull uh, really makes it uh, so the intervention is easier um, or as easy as it can be. Uh, and I think once again, creates a dynamic where you can get uh, to proximal more control more quickly and you can get out of the operating more quickly with minimal blood loss and minimal temperature loss when you're dealing with neonates and infants uh, is of vital importance. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, I, I think I've been able to give you a good sense of, of our experience, uh, the difficult anatomy that we see with these lesions, uh, the propensity of these to present with bleeds, uh, a high number of lesions that we're seeing in the posterior circulation, uh, weird combinations of uh, anomalous vessels uh, with fistulas and true aneurysms, uh, and the, the problems that you have uh, with much younger children um, with all aspects of treatment. Um, we've done over 150 cases in children to date, um, so I think we have a pretty large experience, um, and uh, we continue to see a lot of these cases, and uh, we'll hopefully learn more uh, with each case that we undertake. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Michael Levy, for your intervention. I think uh, a lot of people has learned a lot from, from your vast experience. Uh, right now, we have a few questions from the public. Mm. I'm going to start. Um, is there a scale to rupture prediction like in the adult population? No, <laughs> not one that works. Um, the, the problem is, is, is in dealing with uh, the anomalous vasculature, uh, we see a lot of uh, abnormal multiple aneurysm uh, or giant aneurysms that don't present with rupture. Um, because obviously if it ruptured, uh, it's very likely the child will die. Um, the disease segment uh, aneurysms, or in the one case we saw that was a, a likely aneurysm secondary Epstein-Barr virus, um, those tend to rupture both preoperatively and intraoperatively, but I haven't found anything to date other than those cases uh, that gives me a good sense of when they're going to rupture. Uh, we have many more aneurysms that we follow. Uh, so we try to follow uh, pediatric aneurysms like one would follow an adult aneurysm. Uh, if we see growth of the aneurysm, uh, then we'll intervene. Um, so a lot of uh, much smaller aneurysms that are picked up on routine CT angiography, we'll watch for months to years, uh, a lot of which we don't have to treat. Um, but uh, I don't have uh, really a good understanding of uh, 
to predict the potential of rupture and subarachnoid hemorrhage in this population. What is your personal experience in the treatment of complex aneurysms in pediatric population by indirect revascularization techniques as seen in geosis? Um, early on, uh, once we determined that probably uh, uh, the big saphenous bypasses weren't really making a big difference, um, we've kind of toyed on and off uh, with doing ECIC bypass. Our preference, if we do an ECIC bypass, is try to do a double barrel uh, bypass if possible and get two good connection points. Um, once again, I think the nature of these lesions and the absence of perforating vessels, just by the fact that you can trap and excise a lot of these, uh, I'm not certain uh, if ECIC bypass uh, really contributes a lot. Uh, I think it's a worthwhile thing to do um, in that it just adds uh, another step of protection. Uh, should you create compromise in, in trapping or excising some of these lesions uh, or even using sunt clips and, and uh, having a problematic case such as I showed in that uh, uh, patient earlier. Um, so I, I don't see any problems with it. I think they're safe interventions. Uh, I think they're much safer uh, and simpler procedures than the saphenous bypass. Uh, so I, I think uh, I would recommend to continue doing them. Okay, sir, thank you. Uh, what do you recommend about screening in first degree relatives or pediatric patients with aneurysms? Uh, we usually screen based upon a family history. Uh, so if we get a family history where you get uh, um, generational evidence um, uh, of aneurysmal disease, uh, then we'll usually screen. Um, the difficulty is, is, is the histories can be poor um, a lot of times uh, a relative that dies from a ruptured aneurysm, uh, the family would tell you, well, we had a, a relative that died of a stroke um, or that they bled into their brain, but they can't give you much more information than that. Um, we tend to be aggressive uh, imaging kids um, uh, with uh, not only aberrant anatomy elsewhere in the vasculature, uh, but those kids with Marfan's. Um, and other type of disease states that would obviously give them a, a higher likelihood uh, of having an aneurysm. We're very aggressive in getting imaging studies uh, and at our facility, um, CT angiograms just give us a much better picture and a much better model than the MR angiograms. Uh, but uh, when kids present with subarachnoid hemorrhage, we're very aggressive with get imaging studies on those children. Okay, thank you, sir. What do you recommend then about long-term follow-up in patients with uh, treated aneurysms? I mean, that's a great question. Uh, we're not certain what to do. I try to follow my patients into their 20s. Uh, the question is, is what do you do uh, when they're no longer capable of being followed at a pediatric institution? Uh, we can follow them clinically uh, for a long period of time. Uh, the issue becomes if I'm their primary a physician from a neurosurgical standpoint, um, and there's an issue they can't come to a pediatric uh, emergency department. Uh, so I try to follow them as long as possible, uh, especially uh, where we're seeing these pigtail carotids and such, um, and seeing development of aneurysms in those patients. But I'm only following them uh, into their early 20s. Uh, I would like to follow them for longer, but uh, right now that, that's difficult, at least with the way uh, the medical system is uh, in San Diego. Okay, sir. Abdun Aziz uh, says, thank you, my mentor, for this lucid presentation, and asks, what is the youngest patient you have managed with aneurysm? And secondly, are you suggesting using trapping for infants and older children who meets the criteria? I think the youngest child uh, we've done was a premature infant with a giant aneurysm. Um, the one I remember most obviously is the one I just showed the video on, which was a seven day old with a giant aneurysm. Um, but um, uh, I think seven days probably is the youngest. Uh, we were aggressive early on in, in doing cardiac bypass and kids that were just a couple months old, I think four months and five months um, uh, and older kids with one unsuccessful 
uh, attempt in a Basler aneurysm where despite a, a good clip reconstruction, the, uh, the patient bled during the intervention while being cooled and died. Um, I think every case needs to be taken uh, on an individual basis because once again, this is a different type of anatomic disease. Um, as I've stated, uh, we're doing interventions that you really can't do in adult. We're trapping segments that would definitively lead to stroke in an adult. Um, and so I think the 3D modeling is a big help and, and basically uh, seeing the vasculature and seeing where the perforators are. Uh, with infants, you just can't give them a contrast load where you're gonna get enough information. Uh, and so if you need to do an acute intervention, uh, it's hard to get the amount of data that you really need. Uh, but I think this is a different, a really different population of patients. Uh, I think a lot of it needs to be based upon what you're seeing preoperatively uh, and intraoperatively. Um, it's always hard to propose clipping and trapping everything. Uh, we've been fortunate, but I, I don't know that that should be a recommendation. Okay, sir. Uh, there's a question that says, how do you approach the unruptured aneurysm in a pediatric population? Like, is there a map, mental map, decision map that you have? Um, I mean, there's so many problems. And, and when I think of peds, I'm, I'm, I, I tend to think more of the neonates and infants because of the difficult kids. Um, there's a lot of issues. I mean, uh, younger kids, you really can't use intraoperative angiography. Um, even placing kids in a pin head holder can be quite difficult. Uh, we use a pin holder that also has a, a base. Uh, so the head rests uh, on the base. So if they come loose from the pins, um, we're not going to uh, have movement or, or, or create a uh, kind of a loss of pin crisis. Uh, we're using uh, specific um, Mayfields that are radiolucent, but these are not made for children. So trying to use a large radiolucent head frame made for adults in a pediatric uh, population is difficult. Uh, making sure the room is warm, uh, starting the infusion of blood, uh, understanding there's going to be blood loss at every level of the surgery, uh, and understanding you basically have one rapid chance to get proximal control. And once you're there, you're in a good place. Uh, up until you get there, um, bad things can happen. And, and these kids, once again, die very quickly. Um, I think it's a combination of, of a vascular experience and a pediatric experience um, that lends to my approach to it. Uh, I don't know that it's any different than an adult vascular uh, surgeon would take. It's just you're dealing with a different population of patients that uh, have problems with temperature control, blood loss, um, and tend to go downhill much more quickly. Uh, probably a good reason that a lot of pediatric neurosurgeons don't like to do vascular cases. Uh, I was fortunate that for nine years, I was uh, uh, a vascular neurosurgeon in addition to a pediatric neurosurgeon when I was at USC. Uh, and so it, it, it changes my approach to these, but, um, but this isn't something uh, um, that uh, makes sense uh, if you don't do a lot of pediatric surgery because the blood loss uh, factor in getting there is a huge issue. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, have you seen any relationship or cases between COVID and subarachnoid hemorrhage recently? No, we've had uh, one patient that presented with uh, hemorrhage into the brain that was COVID positive. Um, this wasn't a, a vascular patient. This is a patient that had a, uh, an arachnoid cyst that was fenestrated, uh, was not COVID positive in the hospital, uh, returned to the hospital with uh, new evidence of multifocal bleeds into the brain. Um, Okay. My assumption is that they were related given that the patient was COVID positive and there was nothing about the prior surgery uh, that should create that type of phenomena. Um, but no, we haven't seen anybody else other than that patient. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, are there any recommendations about giant aneurysms diagnosed in intrauterine? Um, no, other than... Uh, I think three of the cases I, I showed were giant aneurysms. Uh, I had a giant fistula that I didn't show that were all diagnosed in utero. Um, 
really the determination is when one needs to intervene. Uh, one of the problems is the size of the aneurysm mass effect. Uh, another problem is, is the aneurysm creating a steel phenomena. Uh, so is the presence of the aneurysm basically to a steel phenomena where you're compromising adjacent uh, regions of brain? Um, how comfortable uh, do you feel sitting and watching this child monthly? Um, is the head circumference getting bigger? Is it associated with hydrocephalus? Um, I tend to operate on, on giant aneurysms that are found in utero pretty quickly, um, but that's uh, just my experience. Okay, sir. Uh, Simona Simonescu is asking, who is, what is the rate of recurrence for giant aneurysms? Uh, in my experience, it's been zero, uh, but that's because most are trapped. Okay. Either trapped, trapped excised, or trapped and bypassed. Um, with our clip reconstructions, um, we uh, have also been very lucky. But once again, this isn't uh, an adult series in the hundreds. Uh, it's a very large pediatric series, but, but once again, we're still learning and we have a lot more cases before we can make more definitive recommendations. Uh, the use of a single clip, I think, is important. I think you have less chance for compromise. But some of these things just don't lend themselves to uh, single clip ligation, and you need to do clip reconstructions. Okay, sir. Um, before we get on with a couple more questions, I'm going to tell the audience that the next conference uh, for Dr. Mark Richardson is about to start. So you can go back to the web page and click on Join Now in his conference, which is called Movement Disorder Surgery Research and Innovation. Uh, I think we have a couple more questions that we can ask uh, during the time. In patients uh, less than six months with large incidental aneurysms, sometimes the vessels are too small to try endovascular therapy. In these cases, do you recommend weight or operate treatment? Um, I mean, that, that's exactly the problem. It is not only are the vessels small, but, but also given the, the weight of the child, uh, uh, the dye load and, and, and sometimes getting real good studies can be difficult. Um, I started this business a long time ago and in the 90s, uh, the interventional techniques were very, very primitive compared to what they are now. Um, I think that for a lot of our worrisome posterior circulation aneurysms, uh, we're doing interventional procedures in all of those patients. Um, Basilar aneurysms, that's the only way I'll treat them at this point. Vertebral artery aneurysms, I'm not a big fan of coiling, uh, given that we've had a number that we've had to operate on uh, following, and whether that be to try to trap the aneurysm, to try to bypass it, uh, or to try to remove the coils. Um, I'm not sure historically what the best thing to do is. Uh, if you have a child that's over six months of age, uh, really not the best candidate for an interventional procedure. Do you need to intervene? Uh, once again, I guess, you know, you base your decision on what the presentation is. Is this something that was just found uh, on ultrasound? Uh, was this something that uh, presented as a result of a cranial nerve palsy, a bleed, uh, hydrocephalus, or, or a steel phenomena? Uh, so based upon those considerations, uh, I think that determines uh, whether you should intervene or not. Uh, I tend to be more aggressive with giant aneurysms and little kids and, and most of these children uh, I will operate on. Okay, sir. And the last question uh, would be, what is your preferred donor vessel for a bypass? And what type of bypass you have had to do more frequently? Um, that's a good question because that's a mistake we made early. I mean, all of our uh, all of our bypasses early on were done with cadaveric saphenous, which, which was a huge mistake on our part and little kids because that's uh, where you get really significant mismatch between the vessels, uh, even with endocyte anastomosis. Um, I stopped doing bypasses uh, probably over 15 years ago, uh, at least uh, Petrus carotid. Um, to carotid bypasses uh, just with the belief that you don't necessarily need them in small children uh, because of the embryologic nature of, of this disease. Uh, so 
we were probably doing a lousy job with the wrong substrate. Uh, I think if you're going to do uh, uh, a bypass uh, with the origin of the Petrus carotid, where you drill out glass cocks, uh, I think uh, harvesting artery is probably the best thing to do at this point. Uh, I think an arterial graft is much better. Um, I think probably ECIC bypass, as I mentioned earlier, uh, especially if you can get a double barrel bypass uh, in conjunction with the trapping is probably a real good approach. Uh, and I'm still learning as to whether that's the best way to do it or not. There's a question that uh, Asif Raihan is asking, I think it probably summarizes everything you've said. What are the special considerations in bypass in pediatric age group? Yeah, pretty much what I've noted. I mean, we've done bypasses in very young children. Uh, one of the benefits in pediatric cases is that you have a minimal amount of bone uh, over the petrous carotid. Uh, so it's very easy to mobilize. A lot of times you don't have to drill out the rhomboid construct to get there. Uh, the difficulty is a small amount of space. Uh, our graphs were much too big for uh, what we were trying to do. Uh, it's probably at that point in my career something that I would have been uh, not successful with uh, having uh, Taka Fukushima uh, as part of the surgical team really made it so it was something that could happen. Um, I don't know how I feel about it now. I think if I was going to do uh, another bypass with an origin at the Petrus carotid, I think I would do an arterial graft and I think I would harvest that from the child. Uh, I think that would be the better way to do it. Uh, I think I would spend a lot of time in the preoperative analysis of the case and probably consider doing a double barrel uh, ECIC bypass in conjunction with the trap. Um, because I, I think there's no downside to do an ECIC bypass. Uh, when you do an ECIC bypass, you get the benefits of both a direct and indirect bypass. Uh, and I think that in conjunction uh, with a trapping, whether it be just a pure trapping or a trapping excision, uh, at least in anterior circulation aneurysm is probably the best thing to do. Uh, pica bica bypass is not a difficult thing to do. Uh, and uh, so for uh, pica aneurysms, uh, I think direct uh, pica pica bypass uh, is probably uh, the best way to go. Um, haven't had an opportunity to uh, uh, do any number of other types of bypasses in my population. Okay, sir. Well, um, I think we close the Q&A section now. On behalf of CN, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Levy. This has been a wonderful lecture. We are really grateful and honored for your participation in the 2020 IWBNC. Uh, more than 350 people were connected with you. We've had more than 3,200 registrants over 115 different countries. Uh, you're more than welcome to stay tuned to the rest of the conferences of the day and tomorrow. And like I said earlier, uh, Dr. Richardson has just started his conference in movement disorder surgery, research and innovation, which you can join through the webpage. Uh, thank you very much, sir, again. Thank you for having me. I very much appreciate it. Thank Looking you, forward to seeing you in Colombia. We too, sir. We will do. All right. Bye-bye. Goodbye.